Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, go ahead and respond to the, uh, the online poll if you have not done so already. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, happy Friday. Um, Game of Thrones starts up this weekend. I'm very excited. Um, anyway, okay. We'll, uh, we'll take a look. So uh, today's lecture, we will cover the, uh, the topic of regularization. And I don't know if you've heard of this uh, regularization. It's, uh, it's the idea of, well, uh, well, we'll explain. Okay, so one, um, a common issue that we need to constantly be dealing with is uh, this problem of overfitting, okay? Um, and so, you know, when, when we overfit, that means our model ends up uh, kind of modeling odd specifics of our training data, okay? So you've gathered a whole bunch of data on people, and maybe in your training data, you happen, you know, I don't know, you're, you're trying to predict um, who's going to, uh, I don't know, spend more money at the movies or something, okay? And it just so happens that maybe in your data, people who, um, and you gathered all sorts of information, I don't know, maybe people who happen to wear um, a certain watch brand ends up, you know, showing some kind of correlation with spending more money at, at the movie theater, okay? And so if you overfit, you might end up training that and you might include that in your model. But then when you see uh, new data, um, you know, whatever weird pattern showed up in your training data doesn't actually hold because it's not something that that happens in the real world. It's just it was just a coincidence of your training data. You end up, you know, modeling those weird things. And so, um, uh, so what ha happens is you can predict your own training data very well, but you can't predict uh, new data. Okay? And so, one tool that we looked at for handling or helping us with uh, this problem of overfitting was cross-validation. And so cross-validation takes uh, all of your available data and it intentionally splits it into training and validation sets, okay? So you train it on a part of the data and then you kind of validate it against the, the part that you didn't use for training. And, and that helps you kind of select the model that um, uh, does a good job of predicting, right? So that, that was one thing. Um, and today we're going to look at another method uh, called regularization, okay? And what regularization does is it modifies the loss function so that it penalizes complex models, okay? So basically, um, the idea is that, well, if you don't want to overfit your training data, just don't make your model too complicated, okay? Keep your model simple, and you're less likely to be overfitting, okay? And that's kind of the... Uh, overall principle, and so we just say, you know, let's apply some kind of penalty to uh, the complexity of the model. If the model is complex, we're going to penalize it. Okay, so in uh, ordinary least squares regression, this is our loss function, right? It's our total squared error. It's the difference between the actual, the t, minus what our model predicts, which is x times w. That's a uh, the linear model, x times w, and we just do take that difference, t minus xw, uh, and then we basically square it, uh, but in vector notation, if you kind of just multiply that vector by its transpose, you end up getting the, the, uh, the sum of the squares, okay? Um, so this is our, our loss function, and, um, and basically, with this, uh, with this loss function, the, uh, the best model is the one that mo um, minimizes this mean squared error, okay? And so if we're guided only by this thing that says, let's minimize the mean squared error, we're going to end up making, we're going to include as many terms as possible uh, so that we can uh, get a lower mean squared error, okay? And, and you guys have seen this where, uh, you know, even in the homework, where if you include all of the... Uh, I think one of the examples was like trying to predict the uh, the intensity of the uh, the peasant revolution, right? Um, and and you have all all sorts of these uh, these things, and if you include them all, that that will result 
in the highest R squared and the lowest MSC, okay? But even from, uh, you know, your classical regression, your 101A class, you know that you should kind of check to see if those coefficients are even um, significant in the first place. And so you have kind of like the F, F test to decide if, if they're significant or not. We're not going to bother with any of that. We're just going to say, you know what, let's modify our loss function, okay? And so we, uh, our modified loss function, which we we're calling L prime here, is just the OLS loss plus some kind of um, measure of complexity, okay? So if the model gets more and more complex, this thing will get bigger, okay? And so we're tr if we're trying to model, um, minimize this entire thing, we want to minimize both the uh, OLS loss and minimize the complexity, okay? And this lambda kind of tells you how, how important or unimportant um, this model complexity penalty is. <clears throat> so, um, so if lambda is zero, then L prime is just your OLS loss, okay? So if you say there's no, um, if you take the model complexity and you multiply it by zero, um, then, um, then you'll end up just minimizing the OLS loss. But as you increase the lambda, the complexity of the model applies more and more and more of a, of a penalty, and so, um, so you start avoiding complex models. Does that kind of make sense? Right? Um, and, I, and I said, you know, here's a, I tried to make an analogy to real life, okay? Uh, and I said, you know, so one day you might have to look for a place to live, okay? And you, maybe you're considering a couple apartments, like you get a job and you're considering where to live and you're looking at apartments. And so we'll say, you know, I don't know what apartments cost, but, um, you know, maybe you're considering an apartment that costs $2,000 a month uh, and it's five minutes from your job, okay? And then another apartment that you're considering is $1,800 a month, so $200 less, but the commute is 45 minutes each way, right? And so how do you decide, right? So if money is the only factor, then your decision making is easy, right? You just pick the, pick the apartment with the lowest cost, right? And so um, if, if, uh, if money is tight, you know, then, then money plays an important factor, you know, you're gonna just pick the, uh, the one that's cheapest, okay? But most people value their time and, uh, and so even though this apartment costs less, it comes with a penalty, okay? And the penalty is the additional time that you spend on, on the commute, right? And so um, depending on who you are and who, what your personal preferences are, so if you, if you value your time greatly, so I don't know, maybe you have an active social life outside of work or you're in a relationship or something, and, um, or maybe you just hate commuting, you hate the idea of having to sit in traffic, um, and then you'd weigh that penalty of the longer commute a lot heavier, okay? And, uh, and in that case, you're probably going to select the apartment that's closer to work because the penalty of commuting more outweighs any kind of savings that you get in the rent, okay? And on the other hand, if, uh, if you don't have too much going on outside of work, you know, that extra time you uh, save isn't um, gonna make a huge difference in your life or, um, or maybe you just actually, maybe you enjoy the commute. Maybe you like having that kind of time in the morning, listening to podcasts, audiobooks, whatever it might be. Then the penalty for having a greater commute is, uh, is a lot lower, okay? And you would probably select the, uh, the apartment with the, uh, the lower rent, okay? And so here we said, uh, so I wrote, the true cost of the apartment is going to be rent plus the, some preference factor multiplied by the commute penalty, okay? Which is very similar to uh, kind of the OLS plus some kind of um, lambda weighting parameter times the uh, model complexity penalty uh, ends up being kind of the, the modified loss, uh, and, it, and it's similar to this, okay? Um, and obviously, this is a simplified example, you know, picking a place to live and what kind of decisions you make, you know, will generally have more more things, but um, but that's kind of what we've got, right? Um, one thing where the kind of the apartment analogy doesn't work is that we are not 
Uh, so the, the apartment analogy, I was comparing one apartment versus another, okay? With this, we are, um, we're not comparing one model directly with another. We, are, we have modified the loss function. We've, we've said, you know, our loss function now has to uh, take into account how complex our model is. And what we're doing is we're still trying to optimize the loss function. We're still trying to minimize the loss or minimize the cost of the model that we pick, okay? Um, so we're, we're just trying to pick, we're still trying to pick the best coefficients to use, uh, but we have to take into account the, uh, the penalty of having a complex model. Okay, and so um, you can read more about this on Wikipedia, but, uh, but this is what we have. Um, you know, here I wrote lambda times complexity. Uh, kind of the more generalized idea of regularization is you just have some kind of regularization function which is applied to the function, the model itself, f. Okay, so, so what is the uh, regularization term of the model function f multiplied by lambda? All right. So, um, you know, how, how do we measure uh, a model's complexity? This, this part gets uh, a little bit, um, I don't know, a little, a little bit more abstract. Okay, so here we're going to just say we've got two possible models. One is going to fit a fourth order polynomial, and another one's going to fit a fifth order polynomial. Okay, or, uh, you know, one's going to use kind of uh, one set of variables and then the other one's going to use more. So we know that the fifth order polynomial is more complex, okay? And its function has a, an intercept, a w1, w2, w3, w4, and w5. It's got kind of six, six parameters to, uh, to estimate, six w parameters to estimate, okay? Um, if, however, you uh, force w5 to be equal to zero, then the model is reduced to the fourth order polynomial. Okay, so, so technically the fourth order polynomial can be written as a fifth order polynomial where we've just forced w5 to be equal to zero. Okay, so you can, you can say, um, so, so we can say that um, we can reduce model complexity by uh, counting um, how many non-zero elements of W we have, okay? So if we have, if all of the elements in uh, W are non-zero, that's gonna be kind of your most complex, but if you have fewer non-zero ele uh, non elements, okay, then that means your model is gonna be uh, less complex, okay? So if, if W um, has only uh, kind of, so here we have five, elements in W that are not zero, and here we have, I'm sorry, here we have six elements in W that are not zero, and here we only have five. So this is going to be less com complex. And so this is known as the L0 norm of a vector. The L0 norm of a vector is just how many things are not zero. Um, and so we can write it like this. Uh, so this, this notation is uh, you take the vector and you have the L0 L0 norm, which is uh, how, the count of how many non-zero elements you have, okay? Um, the trouble with this is that this function is very, very, very difficult to optimize, okay? Because um, uh, it's not convex, and, uh, and the only way you can kind of optimize this is you have to consider every permutation of which elements are going to be zero versus non-zero, right? So if you have... Um, six elements in there, if, if W, if you're considering a fifth order polynomial, you have six uh, elements in your vector W, you're going to have two to the six um, or 64 uh, possible permutations of which, which elements of W are zero versus non-zero. And then, even if you consider every single one of those possible permutations, you have to consider kind of all the possible values that those Ws can take on, okay? And so, um, for any kind of problem that has more than a few uh, elements, the, the number of computations just grows um, uh, exponentially and, and becomes incredibly uh, staggering. And so, um, 
So we rarely try to optimize this directly, okay? We rarely try to use the, uh, the W0 norm. So uh, an alternative to using, I mean, uh, an alternative to using the L0 norm is to use the L1 norm. The L1 norm is the sum of the absolute values in W, okay? So um, is this okay, this, all of this talk about norms and stuff? So, uh, so the L, L, L0 is how many non-zero elements you ha have, and the L1 is basically the absolute values, um, but you, you sum them up, okay? So you take, uh, you take uh, your vector, you sum up the absolute values of the terms, and that's gonna be your L1 norm, all right? And it's no longer um, just how many are zero versus non-zero, but it still is a measure of complexity, okay? So um, if the element in W is zero, it will contribute nothing towards complexity. And if the element in W is not zero, it contributes something to the complexity. And as, that, uh, as the value in W gets bigger, it's gonna contribute uh, even more to the penalty. Okay, um, and so when you try to optimize the uh, the loss function, what this tells us is that the uh, reduction in the uh, MSE or um, maybe even just the sum of squared errors has to be greater than lambda times kind of the uh, the size of W. Okay, and uh, and this is known as the lasso. Okay, um, so the uh, the there's a lasso regression, and this is basically a, a modification of the, the OLS using this L1, or a Manhattan distance norm, okay? This L1 norm as the penalty of complexity. Um, and then the, the other option that we can use is using the L2 norm, okay? And so, uh, I didn't write this here, but one drawback of using the L1 norm or using absolute values is that um, it's, you can't take derivatives, right? You can't take derivatives of absolute value functions because you get that corner um, at the zero, and so taking the derivative is hard. Uh, we can optimize it. We can use functions like optim on the computer and, uh, and optimize it, uh, but you don't have a closed form solution, okay, for something like this. Uh, if instead of using um, the L1 norm, you use the L2 norm, okay? So here we're, uh, we're gonna kind of me measure the, um, the, the magnitude of the elements in W by squaring them and summing them up. So it's kind of like a Euclidean distance thing. Um, this, uh, this ends up being, um, this will have actually a closed form solution. I didn't bother uh, writing it. It's in the textbook, the, uh, the closed form solution for, for, uh, for solving this. Um, and the, uh, the difference here, though, is that, you know, if w is 0, it contributes nothing to the penalty. Um, but because it's squared, big values of w are heavily penalized, and small values of w are, are uh, penalized, but uh, much less, right? So if you have, if W is like 0.5, after you square it, it only contributes 0.25 to the penalty, okay? And so, um, so the, uh, the penalties uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller as, as W's uh, get smaller. And so, um, um, so what ends up happening is that ridge regression favors when the values in W are similar to size in each other, okay? So it, it does not like, ridge regression does not like when one W element is big and another W element is small, okay? It tries to, um, it will try to push both W elements to be uh, similar in magnitude because um, that's going to kind of minimize the, uh, the sum of the squares there, right? So if you have, uh, if one thing is 8 and another thing is 2, 8 squared is 64 and 2 squared is 4, you get 68. But if you kind of push, push those down, and if you increase the 2 to a 3 and the 8 down to a 7, okay, um, 
uh, then seven squared is 49 and three squared is nine and so uh, you know that that reduces it down to uh, I guess 58 versus the L1 norm sees the eight and the two equal to the seven and the three eight eight plus two is ten seven plus three is ten okay and so so the L2 because you're squaring them doesn't like it when these two things have uh, different magnitudes whereas uh, the the L1 just kind of cares about the uh, the total values of these things. Okay, so um, so for some kind of example, I'm uh, I'm going to just generate some simple two-dimensional data. Okay, uh, basically I've got uh, a grid x1 and x2. X1 is the values one through four, and x2 are the values of one through four. But I've created a grid. See, so I've got kind of the 16 pairs of points here. Okay, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, and then, you know, two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, three, one, three, you know, so on and so forth. They've got a grid of points, and the true relationship between x1 and z, or x1, x2, and z is that um, the true value of z is going to be one and a half times x1 plus 0 0.5 times x2. I've purposely left out uh, the intercept in the true model, okay? Uh, and this is because I want to show you uh, contour plots, and with a contour plot, I can only have two two parameters in there at a time. Okay, so I want to show you uh, two, you know, these contour plots. But because our brains can only think in three dimensions, um, or visually, um, I'm only including two two x variables. Okay, so this is the true relationship. There's no intercept. Um, but what I do is I add some random noise, okay? So I use R norm, I add some random noise, and if I use um, LM, okay, that's going to fit your ordinary least squares. And, uh, and so I say Z is, um, which is kind of the true Z plus the noise, maybe I should have said T, is a 0 plus X1 plus X2, and, uh, and I ask for the coefficients, and we get 1.4. 4.58 and 0 0.453, okay, which is pretty close to the true uh, true relationship, which is 1.5 and 0 0.5, okay. But I just added some random noise, and so uh, these are the coefficients that minimize the um, uh, least total least squares or uh, mean squared error, okay. I'm going to, um, in order to kind of plot our contours, I create a function called OLS loss, and uh, and all this does is it just takes uh, you know z minus x times w times z minus x times uh, I'm sorry z minus x w or t minus x w transpose times uh, so z minus x w transpose times z minus x w that's going to give us our total um, squared error. Okay, uh, I, I guess I left off the one over n term, but it, it's fine. Okay, and uh, and the previous lines of code just kind of make sure we have everything in matrix notation. All right, and um, and in order to kind of uh, be able to use the uh, the function optim, uh, I have to write the function in order to accept some argument called par. Okay, so I just uh, I take the OLS loss and I just modify it so it takes in uh, the, the arguments par and it and it. Uh, and it returns what, what I'm asking for here, okay? Uh, and so if I use optim on this, I get uh, pretty much the same estimates. It's just ever so slightly different. LM gives me back 1.4588837, and by using optim, which uh, just keeps iterating until it gets pretty close to the answer, it gives me 1.4588833, okay? So it's, it's off by just a tiny bit uh, at the at the end, but it but it, this is pretty good, okay. So um, so is that okay? I I haven't le formally covered the use of the function optim in lecture, but you have it in your homework, and I don't think it's too too complicated to use. So uh, so this I'm just optimizing the function here, okay. And then um, I have it go over an entire grid, okay of Possible w1 and w2 uh, values of our coefficients. Okay, so I say, you know, let's tr test out values of w1 from negative 1 to 3, and let's test out values of w2 from negative 0.5 to 2, and then I just kind of iterate over everything, and I just, for every single coordinate, 
I calculate the OLS loss using our OLS loss function. Okay, and then I say let's plot the contour. And so this is what our contour plot looks like with the um, best estimate right here. Okay, so that goes right in the middle, and uh, and this looks just like we might expect. Okay, we have um, kind of this uh, paraboloid or ellipsoid thing, um, and you can imagine this bowl uh, coming up and we just want to end up right here in the middle. Okay, so now I'm going to make a new loss function, okay? I'm going to call this the L1 loss. The L1 loss takes in pretty much the, uh, the same arguments, okay, except, uh, and what it does is it calls OLS loss, it takes the ordinary least squares loss and it asks for what's the loss from the ordinary least squares, and it just adds lambda times the L1 norm, which is the sum of the absolute values of W. Okay, so that's all it's doing. It's going to take the, um, the OLS loss and add the sum of the absolute values multiplied by some term lambda. Is that okay? And then again, um, I make a, a wrapper function so that it uses, uh, so I can use it with optim, which has to be written in the form of using uh, par, okay, the, uh, the parameters to optimize. And, um, and this is a little bit hard to tell, but when we use um, OLS, the best value that it came to was 1.458 and 0 0.453, okay? And here I'm gonna just show you what happens when I change lambda from 10 to 50 to 100. So these are just kind of the, the best values we get after running optim on the modified loss function. So we've turned the loss function, and rather than just saying minimize the OLS, we now have to minimize the OLS plus this L1 stuff, okay? So if I, if I try this out, we can see that as I increase my lambda, the actual, the values of W themselves start shrinking, okay? We start at 1.45, and as lambda increases, it goes down to 1.43, 1.34, and 1.23. And that's because each value of, uh, as w gets bigger, um, and I multiply it by lambda, the, um, this penalty gets larger, right? And so, so we're trading off, you know, when I pick a different value of w, my OLS will go up, but my maybe my absolute value of the w's go down, okay? So when I'm shrinking, so it's kind of this balance. I'll allow my OLS estimates to get bigger, or I mean, so my OLS error, my um, least squares error to get larger um, in exchange for shrinking my uh, w estimates, okay? And, and we can see that uh, if I push lambda to be something like 500, <coughs> then we're pretty much getting values of zero, okay? Values pretty much close to zero for uh, what W should be, okay? Because at that point it's saying, you know, anytime you mess with W, um, it's gonna cause the, the penalty to get really huge, so the best option at this point is to just uh, use zeros and have my OLS be way off, but, but I'm keeping uh, small Ws, because the penalty for having any kind of W there uh, is, is huge. Is that okay? So these, these things uh, called, of regularization, these are also called shrinkage methods, okay? They're also known as shrinkage methods because they cause our parameter estimates to shrink, to, to tend towards zero. So I, um, I want to show you some contour plots of all of this, okay? So back here, this is the contour plot for the ordinary least squares loss function, okay? And now, here is a contour plot of the uh, loss function when, um, if I use the regulari regularized loss function where lambda is equal to 10, okay? And it doesn't look like there's much of a difference here, okay? This red dot represents where the ordinary least squares, the best estimate is, and this represents where the um, uh, best estimate is the blue dot represents the best estimate when I apply um, use the regular regularized loss function okay and uh, and I'm going to just show you what happens as I increase my lambda okay 
When I increase my lambda to 30, um, we can see that the, um, the best estimate changes. And I've drawn um, lines at 0 and 0 for W1 and W2. And we can see um, something a little bit strange happening here where um, the contour lines kind of have a sharp angle here. Okay? And that's, that's, a, that's an effect of using the absolute value. As, um, as I change the absolute value of, um, if W becomes negative, okay, the contours um, get, get weirder because now we have to add, um, we have to increase the uh, um, kind of the, um, the, the penalty term, right? So, so negative values of W also uh, increase the penalty, whereas when W is equal to zero, the penalty is zero, okay? So we've got W1 and W2, W1 on the horizontal and W2 on the vertical axis. And so here I'm gonna increase uh, lambda even more, okay? So uh, lambda becomes 50, and we can see how the, um, the difference between the OLS remains stationary at that red dot, but the, the optimal Ws start shifting, okay? And we can see kind of how the, um, notice how the contour lines also change, okay? And so as I increase W, so I went from 10, 30, 50, 100, okay? They, uh, we can see the, this blue dot travel in kind of a, a diagonal line towards uh, one of the axes, okay? So this is 30, 50, 100, 150, 180, okay? The, uh, the contour lines, um, R automatically chooses where to draw the contour lines, so um, it, it doesn't always draw them at the same, uh, same levels, but, um, but you can see uh, this stuff happening, and, and, and at lambda equal to 180, the effect of the kind of the absolute value is really uh, strongly pronounced here. Okay, you can see kind of these very sharp angles when, um, when W becomes negative and things like that, because that, that significantly alters the, um, the total loss, okay? And, um, and so as um, lambda increases, eventually the blue dot runs into this axis, okay? And so when it runs into uh, this axis here, I'm not going to be able to improve the, um, the loss function by modifying uh, W2 anymore, okay? So W2 started off around 0.5, but as I, as I went, kept going up, it, um, it, it pulled these down, okay? And then so as uh, lambda gets bigger and bigger, it just, um, so it's pulling it down in kind of this diagonal direction until it hits the axis, and then as lambda gets bigger, it just kind of pulls it into the, um, the origin. All right, so this is kind of a, by flipping through, it's almost like a little flip book of how the, um, that blue dot travels, okay? So it travels down a diagonal line, which makes sense. If we think about how the absolute values work, okay, if I want to kind of shrink the absolute values, it makes sense to kind of shrink them both kind of at the same amount at the same time until one of them hits zero, and then I would just keep shrinking the other one until that one also reaches zero, okay? Uh, and then if, again, if you look at, pay attention to the contour lines, the, the edges of the contour lines become more and more straight um, and are, are less affected by the uh, OLS amounts, okay? So at this point, it's, you've got these uh, straightish contour lines, okay? So, um, so just some observations here. I wrote, as the uh, lambda increased, the, uh, the contour lines began having sharp corners and straightish edges, and as the uh, lambda increased, we saw the optimal parameter values travel diagonally until it hit one of the axes, and then it gets uh, pulled towards zero, okay? Uh, and if we think about what the L1 norm means, it, it kind of makes sense because as because uh, we're just taking the um, the sum of the, the values and so they're going to get pulled towards um, 
you know, if, we, uh, if, if we're shrinking our things there. Okay. Um, here I, I do something similar. I create a L2 uh, penalty uh, loss function. Okay. So I take the ordinary least squares loss and I'm going to add lambda times the sum of w1 and w2 squared. Okay. So I'm going to square our elements of w and then uh, sum them up and multiply that by lambda. So that's going to apply the L2, L2 norm. Okay. Again, uh, to kind of get our best values, I throw that into an optim optimization function. Okay, and uh, and so as I increase uh, lambda, again, we can see the values. So here's something interesting. This one starts off at 1.45, and as I increase uh, lambda, they shrink from 1.45 down to 1.249, 0 0.92, 0 0.74. What about x2? It starts off at 0 0.45, but then it increases to 0 0.579, 0 0.63, and now it starts coming back down to 0 0.57. And as I continue to increase lambda, they get smaller and smaller, uh, you know, 0 0.47, 0 0.37, 0 0.27, whereas these ones keep getting smaller. Okay, so there's, uh, with the L2, we see this kind of this weird thing happening where this seems to increase and then shrink back down. Okay, and again, if we think about what's happening with the L2 norm, where we're squaring the values, and we end up punishing uh, vectors where one value is much larger than the other. Okay, like having um, if one value is much larger and you square it versus the other is is smaller and you square it, that's going to end up having a greater penalty than um, than another vector where uh, the two values are of similar size, okay? And, and so what the L2 norm tries to do is it tries to pull things towards uh, a scenario where the elements in W have similar size, okay? It, uh, the L2 norm is happy when W, uh, you know, the S coefficient W1 and the coefficient W2 are of similar magnitude, okay? And so here I've drawn this uh, dotted line to represent the line where W1 and W2 are equal, okay? Um, so that's, or, um, so it's gonna pull towards this line. And so the red is the OLS, and again, pay attention to the blue dot. When here with lambda equal to one, it pulls it uh, a little bit towards this dotted line. Here I increase lambda to five, Okay, and um, the uh, the blue dot, you know, is is getting is going to get pulled towards this line, and then once it kind of reaches close to the line, it's going to start pulling it towards zero. Okay, as as I increase the lambda, here's lambda equals ten, lambda equals twenty, lambda equals thirty. 40, 50, 70, and, and, and you can see it as I increase the lambda. This is lambda equals 1,000, okay? So let me just kind of, we'll flip through this like a little flip book, okay? A little, almost like an animation, but I'm just tapping my keyboard quickly. Um, and so you can see that blue dot travel. Uh, it approaches that um, dotted line where the two parameters are equal, okay? And what do you also notice about the uh, the contours? Okay, so here the contour lines start off as ovals, but as I increase that penalty, what's the shape that they start taking? They start looking a lot more like circles because if you think about um, what that L two norm is, it's it's basically uh, you know Euclidean distance. Um, and so it, it's forming, uh, it forms circles, okay? And so at this point, what it's basically saying is we're looking at um, as our uh, values get, you know, farther away from zero, uh, the, the penalty gets, gets larger uh, in terms of uh, looking like circles, but, um, but, you know, we're also still including kind of the, uh, the ordinary least squares loss, okay, which, which looks more like this. So this is kind of uh, a morphing of from an ellipse 
to, to a circle. And you can kind of see the, the path that that blue dot um, follows. Okay, So I just wrote some observations here. As the lambda increases, the contours look less elliptical and more circular. Um, the optimal parameter values travels towards the line, oh, this should say w1 equals w2. Uh, until it got close and then it gets pulled towards zero. Okay, so as, as we increase the lambda, we, we're uh, applying penalties for any basic W that's not zero, okay? All right, um, just to kind of illustrate the effect that this has on the parameter estimates, I've, um, I wanted to show, uh, I, I ran a bunch of simulations here, okay? Uh, so here, uh, I take the true model Okay, again, z is 1.5x1 plus 0.5x2, but I'm going to just add noise, uh, random noise to this. Okay, and I'm going to generate 1,000 different random samples. Because what we want to know is, you know, how well do our uh, parameter estimates, estimates work, right? So, so I'm going to generate 1,000 different samples of data, and for each of those randomly generated samples, I'm going to find the best model according to OLS loss, and then the um, OLS plus the L1 penalty with lambda 10, 100, 250, and 500, and I'm also going to find it with the uh, L2 penalty for lambda 10, 100, 250, and 500. So I'm going to fit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9 different um, kind of models to uh, each set of a thousand, okay? Or we're going to kind of find the, the optimal parameters um, uh, for each set of, I'm sorry, each random sample of 16, and, and I do this a thousand times. So this is computationally expensive, but, but it also gives us an illustration. This is kind of the code that I run um, where I just start off with the true model and I, and I fit all of these things. Um, and this is what we get, okay? I have uh, ordinary least squares in black, okay? And then lambda equals to 10 in red, lambda equals to 100 in orange, lambda equals to 500 in blue, um, I'm sorry, and then there should be lambda equals 250 in green and lambda equals 500 in blue, okay? And so what we see is that um, because there's random noise, sometimes you'll get uh, a set of observations where, you know, it estimates uh, W1 to be 1 and W2 to be 1, okay? The, the true relationship is that W1 should be 1.5 and W2 should be 0 0.5, okay? So um, the true relationship is somewhere around here, okay? Uh, but because there's random noise, sometimes the parameter estimates are, are off, okay? And so the... Um, the, uh, the black dots represent uh, what OLS finds, okay? When you um, use lambda equals to 10, it looks almost like it's right on top of the black dots, and in fact, all it is is if you look maybe on your own computer, you'll find that it's just really just a shifting of the black dots, okay? So we're just kind of taking all the black dots and we're just shifting them a little bit, and that forms our red dots. We shift them some more and we get our orange dots, and we shift them some more and we get our green dots. But there's an interesting thing is that when this kind of cloud of black dots crashes or touches one of the axes, it doesn't cross over because uh, if it crosses over, it starts applying additional penalty. So, so um, the penalties are minimized when it actually touches this axis itself. Okay, so, so we're like shifting the cloud of parameter estimates down, okay, until it touches the, um, touches the, the axis and then it kind of just dies out there, okay? Uh, it just remains at zero and, and if you, uh, you know, on your own computer and you, and you look very closely here, you can kind of see um, they just kind of pile up right along on, on the x-axis, okay? And then um, if you take the lambda to the extreme, it just pulls everything down into um, to zero, okay? Uh, and and that's, that's what we get here. This is what it looks like for uh, the L2 penalty, okay? So we start off with kind of the, the same, um, if you look at the, uh, the black dots, the black dots are unmoved, okay? But with lambda equal to 10, 
we can see um, it kind of pulls up all of our parameter estimates. And again, this dotted line represents where W1 and W2 are equal. Um, the re ridge regression or the L2 norm favors where the um, W1 and W2 are similar in size. So it, it's pulling it towards this line, okay? And you can see the cloud kind of moving up to here. And then as lambda increases, that whole cloud shifts uh, and, and starts um, kind of concentrating here, okay? And so with, with lambda being a, a very large number, the, uh, the parameter estimates you get end up having uh, very little variation from each other. They're all going to end up having uh, very similar W1 and W2 values, despite having um, you know, quite, quite a bit of different noise. Okay? And so regularization is one way to kind of reduce the amount of variation you see in the uh, kind of the parameter estimates that you have. So, so um, when you do OLS, it's, it's subject to the random noise that appears in your data, okay? So one person fits this, and you might have the, the same true model, but because you have different random noise, somebody could get uh, an estimate down here, and, and somebody else could get an estimate way up here. Um, as you apply these uh, penalties that uh, penalize these different magnitudes, you start, um, you're limited to just kind of estimates in, in kind of these clouds here, okay? Uh, and I kind of summarized some of these, uh, these observations up in here. Okay, uh, have a good weekend, and we'll see you guys, uh, see you guys next week.